that uh, legislation into the committee and doing doing the study and making sure that um, all the areas are, are, are addressed. Now, as it relates to the provinces, once again, um, the provinces are doing their job at providing service delivery, especially on the healthcare, to a lot of their constituents. It is great that we see, um, in case of Quebec, Quebec is leading that. This is why we need to make sure that we take our time we work with all the provinces and make sure that there is no unintended consequences. And the detail of how they get qualified for, how the money gets transferred, and all of those things are yet to be determined. But there was a need to make sure that we address the, the shortfall for the um, children at the age of under 12 and under, and we are taking a concrete action on that today. I hope uh, my colleagues uh, and his uh, party supports this bill. Thank you. And for a brief question, the honourable member for uh, Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, my colleague. I want to quote B. Brisk, President of the Canadian Labour Congress, who said, moving forward on rental and dental relief is essential and will help ease the affordability crisis being faced by families today. The rising cost of housing and out-of-pocket dental care has put many families underwater. Although the Liberals voted against the NDP's 2021 motion to give Canadians access to dental care, I'm happy the Liberals have finally agreed to follow suit. Does the member agree that this much overdue dental is necessary for all Canadians and would benefit us all? Good question. Brief answer from the member for Rich, from Richmond Hill. Naturally, we do, Madam Speaker. That's why we have introduced the bill and that we've taken the leadership on making sure that the areas that there, there exists a gap in our health care delivery uh, is addressed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member Skina Balkley Valley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a, a pleasure to rise today in this House and speak to Bill C 31, a piece of legislation that comes at a very critical time for a lot of Canadians. I know, like my colleagues here in this place, uh, many of us speak with people in our home communities, across our ridings, about the challenges that they face. And when I speak to folks these days, so many of them tell me about the rising cost of living, about the challenge that that is placing on their family budgets. And many of these people talk to me about it and express how it feels that this is something that is happening to them something for which they have very little agency. They didn't cause the war in Ukraine. They didn't break the international supply chains. They didn't uh, force these huge corporations to uh, act in a time of crisis to jack up their profits on the backs of ordinary Canadians. People are working hard and they're falling further behind. And this, this crisis of inflation affects everybody, but it affects some more than others. It especially affects those on fixed and low incomes. Some, some folks have the ability to shift their spending around, but when you are living on a limited income, when your paycheck is a fixed amount and the cost of everything is going up, you have very few options. And I think everyone in this place would agree that it's there that we should focus our policy attention as legislators. Those are the folks who need help the most right now. So part of this bill is a, a very simple component, the top up of the Canada Housing Benefit, which is going to get a one-time $500 payment to uh, Canadians who qualify for that benefit, specifically families who earn a net income of less than $35,000 a year. Uh, that's going to help 1.8 million Canadians with the cost of living, and it's going to make a real difference. It's something uh, that this government should have brought in months and months ago, uh, but the time to act is now. We need to ensure that this legislation gets through so that people can benefit from this payment. Now, the second part of this legislation uh, is also related to the cost of living. It's going to help Canadians with, with their costs, um, but it's, it's different. Uh, the other part of this legislation, the Canadian dental benefit, is a down payment on something that is going to have a profound and long-lasting benefit for millions of Canadians. It's going to be transformational and it's going to make a difference for generations to come. You know, Madam Speaker, I, I think many would agree that universal health care is our country's crowning achievement. This is uh, possibly our greatest policy achievement, something that uh, is based on a, a, a simple but profound premise which is that in a, in a world in which so many of the aspects of quality of life correlate 
with one's financial status. Health should be different, that everyone, no matter their income, should have access and the dignity of access to basic health care. And yet, ever since uh, the Canada Health Act was, was first passed into law in the 1960s, um, it's been a project incomplete. It's been a vision unfulfilled. Because we all know that there are aspects of our health that were not included in the legislation that created universal health care. It's something that, as New Democrats, uh, we've always held as part of the vision, right back to the days of Tommy Douglas that things like our eyes, things like mental health, things like dental care, these are integral to our concept of health, to our health outcomes, and must be included in our vision of universal health care for all. Now, nobody here in this place can argue that dental care isn't a part of health care. We all know people who suffer from extreme health issues as a result of dental, um, dental pain uh, and dental um, issues that go untreated. Dental care is expensive. Everyone knows this as well. 35% of Canadians lack proper dental insurance, and that number jumps to, um, to 50% when we're talking about low-income Canadians. Seven million Canadians avoid going to the dentist because of the cost. It's shameful. It's something that has to change. And this bill in front of us is the first step in heading down that road. Now, Canada's most vulnerable face the highest rates of dental decay and disease and the worst access to dental care. This is something we have to change. We're going to change that, Madam Speaker. This bill is the start. Now, the legislation in front of us begins with the children of low and modest income families. And that's no mistake, because we all know that if you can catch these dental care issues at a young age, you can prevent much more serious issues down the road. That this is about prevention. It's about helping uh, young children address serious health issues before they become even more serious. In 1964, the Royal Commission on Health Services recommended precisely this. It stated that the government should as quickly as possible implement a dental program for children. And yet here we are over half a decade later, finally tackling this critical aspect of health care. Now, shamefully, tooth decay remains the most common yet preventable childhood chronic illness in Canada. The most common reason for kids undergoing day surgery and, and missing school is dental decay. And the most common surgery performed at most pediatric hospitals across Canada is related to dental issues. Left unchecked, these issues affect people's health in profound ways, as I've mentioned, and it's preventable, and we're finally on the path to making things better. Now, we're not going to stop at dental care for kids, Madam Speaker. Uh, I sent out a, a mail out to my constituents asking for their feedback on this proposed dental care program, and the vast majority of the responses I received were from seniors. And it is absolutely heartbreaking to hear uh, some of the messages that they sent me. Uh, people who, uh, this one woman wrote and she says, my hub husband is working at 67 years old to keep his coverage going. It would be great to have support so he could retire. Someone else says, we skip dental care because we can't afford it and dread the day we might need serious attention. Uh, this, uh, another senior writes and says, last year one tooth cost me $5,000. That's 10 months of my CPP. Madam Speaker, this is, this is something that we can address. And so what we have in front of us with this Canada Dental Benefit is indeed a down payment on a permanent national dental care plan. It's not only going to help kids under 12, it's going to help seniors, it's going to help youth under 18, it's going to help people on disabilities, it's going to help millions of Canadians who are struggling with dental health. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, New Democrats have pushed hard for dental care for a long time. Of course, it was always a part of our vision for universal health care. And just a year ago, our brilliant colleague Jack Harris stood in this house and put forward a motion urging the government to implement a national dental care plan. And it, it's, it's a, a, it was a sad thing that both Conservatives and Liberals voted down that motion, and yet here we are a year later taking the first steps towards a national dental care plan that's going to help millions of people. And we got there 
uh, for one reason, because we didn't give up, because we hold on to that vision of universal health care. It's no coincidence that uh, the last time we achieved a transformational public health policy for Canadians with the Canada Health Act, it was New Democrats coming off the experience in Saskatchewan with universal health care under the leadership of Tommy Douglas, who pushed a Liberal government in a minority parliament to do the right thing and created a change that uh, has benefited so many people over the years. And so here we find ourselves again in a position where um, this idea of making lives better for people by providing this care that so many people need uh, is at a point where we can finally move forward and we're not going to stop uh, until it becomes a reality. Madam Speaker, creating a national dental care plan is about dignity, it's about health care, and it's about bloody time. Thank you very much. Here, here, here. The RO member will have five minutes for questions and comments uh, the next time that this matter is before the House. Statements by members, déclaration de député, l'honorable... The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Madam Speaker, I would like to take a moment to thank the many members of my riding of Richemont, Arthabasca of Quebec and across Canada, and as well as other colleagues from across the party who have showed their support over the past two weeks after my decision to respect my values and convictions and to sit as an independent member. We have an opportunity to live in Canada and in a democracy that is the envy of the world. And we need to show respect to members and denounce bullying in, in all its forms. Madam Speaker, bullying like I have seen 10 years ago, like I saw in politics, is unacceptable. Canadians don't want this way of doing things. And every member must debate with passion, with respect, and not accept hateful or threatening speech. We live, Canadians expect nothing less from us to uphold democracy and to fight the cynicism that is currently at stake. Thank you. Statements by members, the Honourable Member for Scarborough Centre. Madam Speaker, I offer my sincere condolences to the family of Masha Amini, who died in the custody of Iran's odious morality police and allegedly was arrested for refusing to wear a hijab. No government should have any say in what a woman chooses to wear or chooses not to wear. I strongly condemn the actions of the Iranian regime. Canada must demand justice, and this morality police must be disbanded. As you can see, I wear a hijab. This is my choice and mine alone. I will always stand for choice. No one should pressure a woman, whatever her choice is. Wherever we call home, women are entitled to their autonomy. And governments should stop trying to police what we wear and don't wear. I stand in solidarity with those that protest and fight for these rights in Iran and around the world. Thank you. Madam Speaker, our new Conservative leader will put people first, their retirement, their paychecks, their homes and their country first. That is why this past June I introduced my first private member's bill, C-286, the Recognition of Foreign Credentials Act. This legislation will streamline the process of connecting skilled immigrants with jobs that our economy desperately needs. This is a vital step in making life more affordable for Canadians. I spent the summer consulting with stakeholders and constituents to discuss this legislation. The feedback is overwhelming. Canada's foreign credential system is broken. It's a 19th century system governing a 21st century labour market. Madam Speaker, doctors driving taxis is unacceptable. The NDP Liberal Coalition is too busy fueling the inflation fire and hasn't done anything to help newcomers work in their fields. Conservatives, under our new leader, are committed to helping newcomers get the jobs they were trained for. I urge every single MP to lay down their instruments, get to work, and pass this important legislation for our country. Here, here, here. The Honourable for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, watching the growing protests in my home country in demand of justice for 22-year-old Masa Amini, I ask myself how I would have coped if this tragedy and murder had occurred in my own daughter. The heart-wrenching murder of this young woman at the hands of Iran's morality police is yet another demonstration of the unconscionable atrocities and continued violence inflicted by Iran's oppressive regime. The demands of Iranian people and those of us living in the diaspora are simple. We demand justice, accountability, and end to the cruelty of the Iranian regime. In bold acts of defiance, at the risk of losing their lives, the brave people of Iran, led by women at the forefront, are rushing to the street in protest, but their voices are silenced through internet shutdown and killing of protesters. When you see the news, ask yourself, what would you do if it were your mother, sister, wife, or daughter in the headlines? In solidarity with the women and people of Iran, join me in the chant that has swept the nation. Women, life, freedom. Zan, Zendegi, Azadi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Avignon, La Matisse, Matan, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, the Gaspé Peninsula, the Magdalen Islands, the Lower North Shore, and the Maritimes have seen damage. Her, Fiona has left a trail of devastation in its wake. On behalf of the bloc, I'd like to offer my condolences to the victims, to the families of the two victims, and all my support to those who have suffered losses. I'd also like to thank all those who are working to clean up the debris, restore power, and help the victims. I'd also like to pay tribute to my father-in-law, Mario, who was also affected. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that the federal government was active and collaborative this weekend. This is greatly appreciated. But I might also realize that tropical storms in our region are not normal. Climate change, well, our regions are already living with it. Let Ottawa go and ask people whose houses have been swallowed by the sea if it's a good idea to approve more oil projects. Let them explain to people who are losing their cars, their boats, and all their belongings uh, why they are subsidizing big oil. A tropical storm in eastern Quebec is not normal. It's up to the government to ensure that it remains abnormal. The Honourable Member for vaudreuil solange Mr. Speaker, this year, for the 24th time in Rigaud, and for the seventh time in this chamber, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite all residents in my riding to participate in the Festival des Couleurs de Rigaud, which will take place this year on October 8th, 9th, and 10th. Thanks to the great work, once again, of Christian Levesque, Stéphane Fecteau and their team, and with the generous support of Heritage Canada, Mayor Marie-Claude Frigo and her team at the City of Rigo, young and old alike will be able to enjoy the many activities and take a moment to admire the mosaic of colors that autumn offers. Mr. Speaker, the natural beauty of our region and the richness of its artisans will be brought together once again this year in Mount Rigo, and I encourage all members of our community to come and discover them at the 24th Festival of Colors of Rigo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leonard Frontenac Kingston. Mr. Speaker, equipping each RCMP vehicle a decade ago with an automated external defibrillator, or AED, would have cost under $10 million and would have saved roughly 3,000 lives over the 10-year life of the AED units at a cost of $3,000 per life saved. But this Liberal government has done nothing and those lives are gone forever. I first raised this issue in the House in 2015 and again in 2016, 2017, 2018 and 2020. Just before the pandemic, I met with the previous minister and he agreed with me that AEDs should be our priority. In June this year, I questioned the current minister and he boasted it to the House that he was spending hundreds of millions of dollars on what he called life-saving equipment for the RCMP. But in both cases, there was no action. Records confirmed that the last time a minister even requested information from the RCMP or the department regarding AEDs for RCMP cruisers was in November 2014. Surely, Mr. Speaker, the time has come for less wheel spinning and more action. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, great communities don't just happen. They are built on the values of partnership, teamwork and community spirit. Yesterday, all these values were on display as hundreds of residents from the city of Vaughan came together for the annual Run for Vaughan. Organized by the Amadea Muslim Youth Association, 
and now it's now in its 19th year, the Run for Vermont support, supports excellence in health care in our city. Since 2003, the annual event has raised over $1.2 million, with this weekend's event adding an additional $275,000 in support of the Cordellucci Vaughan Hospital. Impressively, Mr. Speaker, this is a youth-led initiative by my dear friend Zuhid Mali, with the run expanding this year to over 15 cities across Canada. Mr. Speaker, the community spirit and generosity of the Amadei community is something that makes the city of Vaughan a more inclusive community and under, underpins the phrase that diversity is truly Canada's strength. As chair of the Amadea Parliamentary Association, I wish to say to the entire community, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to honour Savannah Pakia, a young Inuk woman who was murdered just weeks after arriving in Ottawa to study nursing at Algonquin College in my riding. Before coming to Ottawa, Savannah studied pre-health at the Nunavut Arctic College and worked at the health centre in her home community in Nunavut. All she wanted was to help people. But on September 11th, at 22 years old, Savannah was senselessly murdered in the apartment that she was renting. Too often, young Indigenous women come to our city who do not have access to safe housing. Violence against Indigenous women is very real and very devastating. Because there was no safe place for Savannah to live, her family and her community are grieving. I want to express my deepest condolences to Savannah Pakiak's family and community. We will not forget her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au saint charles Mr. Speaker, the House of Commons has begun a new session of Parliament, and as Conservatives, we are beginning it with a new leader, a leader who in coming months will put people first, their pensions, their paychecks, their homes, and their country first. For this reason, I've been entrusted the position of Lieutenant for Quebec to ensure that our vision for Canada includes the priorities of Quebec society. I accept this role with humility, but also with the certainty that we will rally Conservatives from across Quebec and offer people a new vision of a proactive government and not one that has just governed us for so poorly for the past seven years. In coming months and starting this week, I'll be meeting with the business communities, ethnic communities and various stakeholders to learn more about their vision, their challenges and especially the solutions they propose to improve services. There are many issues that need to be put forward and I will do this in cooperation with my colleagues. Of such an upheaval, we need to see changes and the new Conservative leader is the one who will be able to give hope to all Canadians and also rally a majority of Quebecers. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Milton. On September 12th, a tragic and terrifying series of gun attacks left our community shocked, scared and in mourning. A Toronto police officer, Constable Andrew Hong and Shaquille Ashraf, a small business owner from our community in Milton, as well as his colleague Satwinder Singh, an exchange student, were brutally murdered when a gunman terrorized our communities and the residents of Miss Mississauga and Milton. My sincere condolences go to the families and the loved ones of the deceased. I'd like to extend gratitude to all first responders and the police services of Halton, Hamilton and Peel, as well as the OPP, who work together to bring an end to the attacks. Thank you for your brave and dedicated service. Canadians deserve to feel safe in their homes and in their communities, and nobody should live in fear of gun violence. This government has done more than any in a generation to keep Canadians safe from guns and crime, but there is much, much more work to be done. Yeah. Milton is a strong, compassionate, resilient community and will continue to support each other as we grieve and work through this tragedy. And we'll remember Andrew, Shaquille and Satwinder as community leaders, friends and neighbours. My thoughts remain with their family, their friends and their colleagues. May they rest in peace. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, Hurricane Fiona has been devastating. First and foremost, I must send condolences on behalf of this House to the family of the 73-year-old lady who died in Port of Basque. Further, I want to praise the resilience and camaraderie of the residents of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI and Newfoundland. To see neighbour helping neighbour without pretense or expectation warms my heart as a Canadian. Mr. Speaker, others have lost their homes and their businesses. Power remains yet to be restored to almost 40% of Nova Scotia Power customers. This morning I left my family at home without electricity. 
On a positive note, it's important to remember the Jacob Currys of the world who are fearless, giving of themselves, and a whiz with a chainsaw. How do you get a 60-foot tree off a car without causing further damage? Well, with the three and a half ton jack, a six by six, a couple of two by sixes, and great help, of course. We must remember that coming together in times of great need is what helped build this nation. When given a chance and hope, Canadians will rise to a challenge and give their absolute best. Let us continue to keep Atlantic Canada in our thoughts and in our prayers in this most difficult time. Thank you. Yeah. Nova. Thank you, Speaker. This week has been quite an ordeal for Atlantic Canadians. Hurricane Fiona left desperation and destruction in her path throughout Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, Prince Edward Island, Les Isles Madeleine, and Newfoundland and Labrador. And I stand with this House mourning the loss of life, as all Canadians do. It will take days, if not weeks, to restore the many communities' power. It will take months, if not years, to pick up the pieces of our communities. It's at these times we're proud to be Canadians. We know that through despair and destruction that we will find hope and love, helping one another to rebuild and take care of one another. In the depths of the darkness of the wind and rain, there were many points of light trying to ensure the safety of our loved ones. And I want to thank emergency measures organizations, first responders, police, fire, paramedics, who were there through the hurricane to help the lives and help others. I want to thank power crews and Public Works Department for starting the daunting task of cleaning up. Speaker, Fiona may have knocked us down, but we are Atlantic Canadians. We're already back up, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Pierre Fondolard. Today I rise to underscore the critical situation of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples in Xinjiang, China. Today, the National Council of Canadian Muslims and the Canadian Uyghur community have organized a Uyghur advocacy day on the Hill. In February 2021, this House recognized the Uyghur genocide. Currently, over one million are living this nightmare. Recently, in August, the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, the Human Rights Commissioner for Human Rights, released a groundbreaking report contributing to the mounting evidence of serious and systematic rights abuses against the Uyghur people. The, the UN Human Rights, the High Commissioner for Human Rights further said that these may rise to crimes against humanity. Following the UN report, our Foreign Affairs Minister said two things. Canada will work with the international community to hold China to account and two, that forced labor and supply chains will be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. With the economy on the brink of a recession, the Bank of Canada calling for the suppression of workers' wages, we already know who's paying the true cost of inflation. Central bankers and economists have always known that with higher interest rates will directly result in higher unemployment and cause deeper economic suffering and further exploitation of the working class. Just last week, this Liberal government callously allowed for the extended EI supports to expire, further punishing workers by making it harder for them to access the benefits that they paid into. And the leader of the official opposition has shown Canadians his real priorities, attacking the pensions of vulnerable seniors who need it most and calling for a freeze on employment insurance contributions. So in the face of tougher economic times ahead, only new Democrats are fighting for stronger social safety nets and a cooperative economy that places everyday Canadians and not corporate profit at the heart of economic decision making. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Shefford. The Honourable, go ahead, sorry. Mr. Speaker, the Trois Rivières racetrack has been racing since 1830, making it the oldest racetrack in Quebec. 
bought in 2012 following a bankruptcy, the racetrack set to work to revive horse riding and made it the only active professional racetrack in Quebec from May to November once or twice a week. These races are majestically commented in French by Guy Lafontaine and presented via satellite throughout North America. More than 100,000 people come to Trois-Rivières every year to see the races and admire these magnificent animals at whip work. I hope to have many opportunities to see the unforgettable horses like Poisson d'Avril and Miss Peggy. I congratulate the president of the Quebec Jockey Club, Mr. Claude Levesque, for his excellent work, and I invite everyone to come to Trois-Rivières racetrack. For South Shore St. Margaret's. Hurricane Fiona was not our first hurricane in Atlanta, Canada. Since 1951, we have been hit by 37 hurricanes, 79 tropical storms, and 140 extra tropical storms. We know how to prepare for these. Fiona was different. It was huge, recording some of the strongest winds ever. Many in Nova Scotia are still without power. Northern Nova Scotia and Cape Breton were hit hard. So too PEI and Newfoundland. Homes and businesses have been lost. Critical coastal infrastructure destroyed, farms devastated. Fishing communities have lost their boats, gear, and wharves. Nova Scotians are tough, and we will come together to support each other. I would like to thank the power workers putting in long days to restore power, and those who are supporting their fellow community members at emergency shelters and warming centers. The character of our communities is most present at times of tragedy. As we start to rebuild, Atlanta Canadians know that the strongest storms bring out the best of us. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth Cole Harbour. Mr. Speaker, people across Atlantic Canada and into eastern Quebec have just experienced what is likely the worst system to have ever hit our shores. The images are burned into our memories forever. Homes and loved ones swept into the sea. Communities physically torn apart. Lives have been lost. But through this darkness series, uh, stories continue to emerge of neighbors helping neighbors and incredible acts of kindness, showcasing our region's resilient spirit. Canadian Armed Forces are on the ground in Nova Scotia, in Newfoundland and Labrador, and in PEI, helping where they're needed the most. And our government remains in constant communication with all affected provinces so we can provide support as needed. Folks, we're looking at a very long road to recovery ahead of us. My message to everyone affected by this is that you are not alone. Our government will be there as a strong federal partner every step of the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question oral. Oral questions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. First of all, I'd like to express our full solidarity on behalf of the official opposition toward all the families in the Atlantic and Eastern Quebec whose lives have been upset by Fiona to anyone who has lost a loved one, and our support to anyone who's lost a home or a business. Would the government please tell us its action plan to help and how members of this side of the House can join in solidarity with the government to make that help a success for our fellow Canadians in the East? Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the opposition leader for those comments and all members who've expressed solidarity with our friends in Atlantic Canada. Our thoughts are with all those who have been hit by this storm, especially those who've lost a loved one. The Canadian Armed Forces have been deployed in Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland and Labrador. We've also set up a matching fund to double donations to the Red Cross for the next 30 days. So I would encourage all Canadians to dig deep we have always been there and we will continue to be there for our fellow Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My potato farmers were already suffering because of the self-imposed export ban. Now they may have lost another year's crop. 
Dairy farmers out east are without electricity, meaning they might lose livestock as well. Fishers are losing boats, wharfs, and other critical infrastructure. And traditional bureaucratic government programs are very slow to respond. What will the government do to speed up a response to help those who feed all of us get back on their feet? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as early as last Tuesday, uh, we started working with local communities on the ground, uh, provincial leadership to prepare for what we knew would be a big storm coming. Uh, and indeed, when the storm hit, uh, we were connecting immediately with uh, premiers, with municipalities, uh, with indigenous leaders uh, to make sure they were getting all the support they have uh, and they need. Uh, we will continue to be there as a federal government with immediate supports, uh, with the military where it's needed, uh, with investments. Uh, in in the short term, uh, but we will also be there over the medium and indeed long term as people rebuild, uh, as we support the people who work so hard to keep us fed and support it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Nova Scotia Power reported that the Arrive Can app blocked American crews that were trying to rush into the province to help with the recovery response and wasted valuable time. Originally, the public safety minister denied that that had happened, but only to be contradicted by the emergency preparedness minister, who said, in fact, there was an issue at the border. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister suspend the Arrive Can app today, not Saturday, so that no, no more holdups happen at the border for those who are, who are trying to help those in desperate need? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, everyone's focus is on getting support to uh, affected areas as quickly as possible. I myself saw off uh, an Ottawa Hydro crew uh, heading out to Nova Scotia to help out. Uh, we know how important it is that people get across the border uh, quickly, and I can confirm, Mr. Speaker, that there were no delays uh, at any border because of Arrive Can or, else, or otherwise. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, saint Charles. Mr. Speaker. Electricity is still cut off for hundreds of thousands of people in Atlantic Canada, and many areas are inaccessible. The Prime Minister dispatched some soldiers, but in Quebec in 1978, thousands were deployed to help Hydro-Quebec. Can the Prime Minister say whether the 5th Brigade of Mackenzie has indeed been deployed? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since even before this storm, we've been working with our provincial counterparts to ensure that we have everything ready, including military support. We responded immediately by sending soldiers that were asked for, and we're still there to send more if necessary. The federal government will continue to be there for people in Atlantic Canada and eastern Quebec. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, there were 340,000 homes without electricity in Atl Atlanta, Canada yesterday, and crews from the U.S. were stopped by the Arrive Can app. We asked the Prime Minister to suspend Arrive Can. Can the Prime Minister uh, announce today that Arrive Can will be scrapped for everyone? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand that it's important for everyone to be able to get to uh, where they're needed. We have a team from Ottawa going to Nova Scotia this evening. We have teams coming from the U.S. We thank everyone for pitching in. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, there was no delay at the border because of Arrive Canada or anything else. There was no delay. We are helping make sure that all necessary help gets there quickly. E. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa's ending COVID restrictions at the border. No more testing, no more masks, no more quarantine. Which brings me to health transfers. In 2021, the Prime Minister said he was considering increasing health transfers, but only after the crisis. He said, we'll sit down and talk with the provinces and territories about how to increase health transfers. But those conversations will have to take place after we've gotten through this current crisis. Mr. Speaker, if the crisis is behind us enough to end the COVID restrictions, that means it's time to call a summit on increasing health transfers. When's he going to do it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
As Canadians have seen, the federal government was there with record investments during the COVID crisis over the past couple of years. We're talking about $72 billion in additional investments by the federal government in health care. And it's been months now. Our health minister and other ministers, including myself, we have been in conversation with our, part, our partners in the provinces to see precisely how we can conti continue to invest to get our health care system back on its feet. And we're going to do that together. Now, remember for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, there's one place still in Quebec where the pandemic is still hitting hard. You can't make this up. One place and where the federal government still refuses to invest in health care. I was listening to the Minister of Health, health this morning. He was talking about exhausted health care workers. He said we have to take care of the health care workers if we want them to take care of us. That's a damn fine line, but that's exactly what Quebec is calling for and the federal government is refusing to do. If the Prime Minister wants to take care of health care workers, he should call a summit to boost transfers as quickly as possible. No more excuses. When is that summit going to be held? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what our health care workers need and what our seniors need is concrete support that will help them get the services they need. And that's why we're working with our provincial partners, and we have been for quite some time now, because, yes, we committed to invest more in health care. But I know that Quebecers and all Canadians expect results, Mr. Speaker. It's not just money. It takes more than that. It takes results. And that's why we're discussing with the provinces to make sure that our new investments will truly help the people. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, grocery prices are going through the roof. Bread up 15%, fruit 13%, pasta 32%. Even a bag of apples is up to $8. Families are having to tighten their belts. Meanwhile, the big three grocery chains made $3.5 billion in profits. $3.5 billion. Clearly, the price of groceries is going up because rich CEOs want bigger profits. What's this government doing about it? Nothing. And the Conservatives, they say, let it happen. Instead of protecting the pocketbooks of families, why are the Liberals protecting the profits of rich CEOs? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, here on this side of the House, we're very concerned about the increase, the increased cost of living facing all Canadians. And that's why we came up with a plan to double the GST credit to help families, low-income families, with dental care for their children. And we're, we've invested to help low-income renters get through this crisis. We are there to help. And as we announced during the last election campaign, we're asking big financial companies to contribute more because we need to make sure everyone pays their fair share and that we hope those who help those who are in the most need. Perhaps that the NDP forced the Prime Minister to do. And the reality is there has been no crackdown on profiteering and no attempt to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. Grocery chain profits hit $3.5 billion, while a quarter of Canadians are going hungry. Corporate greed is making inflation worse, and it's hurting Canadian families. While people struggle to pay for their groceries, the Prime Minister is letting corporate greed go unchecked. So will the Liberals put in place a windfall tax to force wealthy CEOs to pay their fair share now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our focus on this side of the House is delivering real solutions for Canadians, which is why we move, we're moving forward with a plan to double the GST tax credit uh, for families that need it, to move forward uh, on uh, dental uh, supports for low-income families who want uh, dental care for their kids, and also move forward uh, with supports for uh, low-income renters as well. These are things that we know will make a real difference in the lives of Canadians who are hurting. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, Budget 2022 included a temporary Canada recovery dividend and increased the corporate income tax on large financial institutions permanently. We will continue to stick up for all Canadians. That's right. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll choose uh, to believe the Premier of Nova Scotia over this uh, Liberal Prime Minister with respect to I arrived at. 
Sadly, there's other things to highlight, Mr. Speaker. Inaction by this Liberal government has left rural and remote Canadians at a serious disadvantage. The last several days while cleaning up has seen Atlanta Canadians with very poor cell phone service. The government promise to improve connectivity for rural and remote Canada has not materialized. For the safety of Canadians, when will this government make connectivity a priority? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that mobile connectivity is very important to rural safety and security and for all isolated areas. The government sees broadband high-speed access as a priority, and that's why we have a fund for th these connections in rural and indigenous communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Cumberland, Colchester. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's that kind of priorities that make us really question how soon help will get to Atlanta, Canada. And we're still cutting down trees to free trap vehicles and damaged buildings. And the people in Cumberland Colchester sadly come up to me and they're very concerned about the economy and the cost of living. They want this Liberal government to know that times are tough, they're finding it hard to make ends meet, and that Hurricane Fiona has made things even worse. They want to know when this Prime Minister will cancel the planned tax hikes on paychecks, gas, groceries, and home heating. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as it's the first time I rise in the House today, let me start with a message addressed directly to the people of Atlantic Canada and the people of Quebec, who have been so hard hit by Fiona. And speaking as a member of this government, as Finance Minister, as Deputy Prime Minister, I want to assure them that they will have our government's full support, I hope this House's full support, in the rebuilding of their homes and their communities. The Honourable Member for Tobik Mactaquak. Mr. Speaker, this past weekend, Atlantic Canadians were hit very hard by Hurricane Fiona. Canadians across the country were shocked and saddened by the images they saw of destruction left behind in its wake. I know that those affected by this tragedy are in the thoughts and prayers of all Canadians. In a crisis, collaboration, coordination, and rapidity of response are critical. Can the Prime Minister tell this House how the government is collaborating with the Atlantic provinces and premiers in their recovery efforts, and why hasn't the government authorized the deployment of more troops for the removal of downed trees in conjunction with the provinces? The Atlantic provinces need help now. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, we agree with our honorable colleague that the Atlantic provinces and eastern Quebec needs help now, and that's exactly what we're delivering to those communities and people affected. I can tell my honorable friend I've spoken with the four Atlantic premiers again this morning. We have an ongoing and active conversation, as do all of my colleagues, and every request that they make of our government will be acted upon quickly. They know that. We acted before the storm hit, so we'd be prepared to respond in exactly the way my honourable fr friend wanted. The honourable member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, for months, Conservatives have been calling on this government to scrap the failed Arrive Can app. But rather than admit it was the right thing to do, the Prime Minister refused to budge on a border policy that was already plagued with issues. Incredibly, this weekend, that came at the cost of emergency crews from the U.S., being stuck at the border when Atlantic Canadians needed their help. Will this government ensure now that useless red tape is eliminated so that Atlantic Canadians can get the support that they need? Yeah. Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by attributing myself to the comments previously made by all, all honourable members, which is that we stand with all impacted Canadians in the wake of Hurricane Fiona. As this House has heard, uh, the government is deploying the Canadian Armed Forces. We are matching contributions to the Red Cross, and we are also uh, dispatching federal funds to do whatever we can uh, to support those impacted Canadians. When it comes to Arrive Ken, I want to uh, inform my honourable colleague that I reached out uh, to Premier Houston, as did my colleague, uh, the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs. We assured him and the member of his government that we will do whatever we can to facilitate travel of first responders to help Nova Scotians, and we will do whatever it takes to support Canadians at this time. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Nova Scotia Power and the Premier 
confirmed that Arrive Can did hold those crews up. People expect the government to be there for them, but unfortunately, this government's still dithering when it's time for action. Fisheries and oceans, Mr. Speaker, if you can imagine, in the middle of the hurricane, ask people not to go onto the beaches to collect uh, lobsters while families were watching their homes swept away. It's unacceptable. Will the prime minister get his troops in line and properly, properly respond to the calls from help from the victims of this storm? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in times of distress or difficulty, it's important to stick to the facts. And that's why I'm pleased to be able to confirm that despite the rumors circulating, there were no delays at the border due to arrive can. The Honourable Member for Megan Ciclérable. Well, that's what Nova Scotia Power said and Premier Tim Eustin said. The Magdalene Islands, Gaspé, and all of Atlantic Canada have been hard hit by Hurricane Fiona. And these were regions that were already struggling with the rising cost of living. Can this government say what steps they plan to take to reduce the administrative paperwork involved in people trying to get their homes and businesses built back as quickly as possible? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Once again, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, and I can assure him that's precisely the kind of conversation we were already having with the Atlantic Premiers and the Government of Quebec. We used an example that the Prime Minister set up with Premier Horgan in B.C. specifically to ex expedite applications for assistance from the federal government to make sure that reconstruction is done in cooperation with the provinces and as quickly as possible. And those conversations will be ongoing. We have an exceptional system. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, thousands of Quebecers marched last Friday to call for more daring from governments in the fight against climate change. The truth is that if one government's not doing enough, it's the federal government. Oil produ production continues to rise. Subsidies to oil companies continue. Canada is still part of the problem, despite the rhetoric. When will the minister switch to climate emergency mode? When's he going to get a bit more daring and start taking concrete action to fight global warming? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for her question, and I'd also like to join with the other members of the House whose thoughts are with the families who lost loved ones during Hurricane Fiona, the worst storm to hit uh, Eastern Canada in a long time. Uh, the atmospheric pressure was the lowest ever recorded and I'd like to congratulate the work of Environment Canada, which made it possible for emergency responders to alert the local population and governments uh, uh, of the dangers of this storm. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Fiona and the destruction in the Atlantic. In Quebec, the Magdalene Islands, the Gaspé Peninsula and the North Shore, they were also hit very hard. And that's a concrete effect of global warming, not to mention the heat waves, forest fires, floods or melting permafrost. It's really not going well. And if we don't do something, it'll only get worse. Does the minister realize that without daring, without strong action, without a serious strategy to fight climate change, we're heading straight for a wall? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. I'd like to remind everyone that our plan calls for investments of $109 billion, which is three times higher than what the U.S. is investing. And we went all the way to the Supreme Court to defend our carbon tax. And we want to get rid of Home heating oil, it's very uh, hi highly pollutive and ineff inefficient. So our government is actually one of the most daring on these issues. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon. 
Mr. Speaker, we'd like to believe the minister. We'd like to see the Greenpeace and Equitaire activists, but we don't see that in him anymore. He says, yes, it's serious, but he also says yes to, Be to Beidou Nord. He talks like a friend of nature and acts like a friend of oil. All he says is he'll do something later, but we need to act now. Let him tell the people of the Atlantic that he has targets for 2030 or 2050. Why put off to, to tomorrow what needs to be done today? Will he cut fossil fuel subsidies immediately? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, that's a bit uh, cheeky for the member opposite when we know that the leader of her party uh, author, uh, or uh, supported um, drilling in the Anticosti region without any environmental assessment. It's a bit much. It's a bit rich coming from her. But our plan was commended by my former colleagues at Greenpeace and Equitaire, if that's of any interest. Thank you. Or St. Margaret's. A critical part of Hurricane Fiona rebuilding is the damage caused to our fishing industry. Wharves are damaged and lost, fishing gear ruined, vessels totaled. Without this infrastructure, there is little economic opportunity for our coastal communities. Wharves are our fishing industry's Trans-Canada Highway. The poor DFO maintenance and management raised in four parliamentary reports made them vulnerable to destruction. They are DFO's responsibility. When will the rebuilding of our wharfs begin? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to add my <clears throat> my voice uh, in 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 thinking of all of the the residents of Atlantic Canada that have been so um, shocked and and uh, impacted, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are assessing the impact on wharves and other uh, infrastructure in the fisheries communities. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, we will be there for people. Uh, I can only imagine how difficult this is for Atlantic Canadians right now, and we will do everything we can to support them. The Coast Guard and the The Honourable Member for South Shore St. Margaret's. Good wishes is not enough. If this happened on the Trans-Canada Highway, reconstruction would be happening now. There are only a few weeks left until winter sets in. We can't wait weeks for assessments, months for design and permitting, months for tendering, months for construction. DFO needs to use its enormous power now to begin rebuilding now. When will DFO do its job, support commercial fishermen, and get to work. <laughs> the bold minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our officials are doing just that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our Coast Guard officials as well, they are standing ready to help in any way possible. They are helping with cleanup. They are helping with assessing the damage. We will be there for the residents of Atlantic Canada. We will be there for the fish harvesters and their, the damage to their interests and their equipment. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Hurricane Fiona has caused devastation in communities across Atlantic Canada. This lobster season has already been a tough one, with bait and fuel prices high and the price of lobster low. Fishermen have lost three days in this short but critical season. The search for gear and resetting of traps will ruin more than a week. Fishing wharfs have been heavily damaged, including a skumanac. Will the minister show support for our fishermen and extend the lobster season? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Well, thank you. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we are very aware of the extensive impacts on residents and fish harvesters in Atlantic Canada. Uh, we are, are certainly considering requests to extend seasons um, as we do the other immediate work to help uh, individuals and communities um, with the impacts of this incredible disaster. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. 23 million Afghans are dealing with drought, food shortages and the breakdown of health services. Canadian humanitarian organizations face criminal prosecution if they even try to help because of this government's restrictive interpretation of the criminal code. 
We have been asking the government to fix this for over a year, and the minister has done nothing. This inaction is shocking. Canadians want to help Afghans in need. Will the government promise to offer a workable solution for Canadian organizations before winter sets in and Afghans begin to starve? The Honourable Minister of International Development. Canada remains deeply concerned about the critical, worsening situ humanitarian situation that's unfolding in Afghanistan. And this is why I announced that Canada is providing additional $50 million for a total of $156 million in 2022 to help support the people of Afghanistan, and particularly women and girls. The funding will allow Canada's humanitarian partner to provide life-saving assistance to ensure that humanitarian goods are dispatched and that workers continue to be able to support the Afghan people. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. on vital species like wild salmon. The science is clear. Open net salmon farms pollute marine environments. Despite promise... I'm just... One moment. <laughs> I'm going to ask the honourable member to start over. There was some technical difficulties and I couldn't hear it and I saw a few other people. And so I'll let her start right from the top then, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Take two. Coastal communities and marine environments depend on vital species like wild salmon. The science is clear. Open net salmon farms pollute marine ecosystems. Despite promising to transition away, the Liberals just approved three fish farm expansions in Clayquot Sound, B.C. So to the Minister, will the government get toxic fish farms out of the water for good while protecting First Nations, workers and communities, or not? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to confirm that we are committed to protecting our iconic wild salmon on the Pacific coast. It's why we are investing so much in the Pacific salmon strategy. I am also deeply engaged in a transition away from open net pen aquaculture. And I would like to confirm that the member is not correct in saying that there's been an increase in uh, in the uh, Clackwood Sound area. It has been a shifting from one to another area Area, but not an increase. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our hearts were with Atlantic Canadians this weekend as their region was hit by Hurricane Fiona. With hundreds of thousands of people affected, it will be taking weeks, maybe months, before things can get back to normal for the worst hit communities. Can the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs tell us how the government is stepping in to help people and businesses recover from this devastating hurricane. Honourable Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for the question. And as colleagues know, the scale of the storm witnessed in Atlantic Canada this past weekend was unprecedented. As we have said, Mr. Speaker, our government stands ready to support provinces and all Canadians during this difficult time. My colleagues and I are, of course, working closely with local and provincial governments, Indigenous governments as well, to respond to the needs of impacted people and their communities very quickly. We obviously invite all those affected to continue to follow the advice of local authorities, and our government will continue to update Canadians on our efforts. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, Atlanta Canadians have been devastated by the effects of Hurricane Fiona this past weekend. They were then shocked to learn from Nova Scotia Power and Premier Tim Houston that emergency crews from our American neighbours were unable to cross the border due to the Arrive Can app. Now, the Prime Minister has stated twice in this House today that no delays happened. But I want to hear it from the Public Safety Minister. Was the Prime Minister correct in saying that no delays happened, yes or no? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I can assure my colleague that the Prime Minister was absolutely correct when he said that there was no delays caused by Arrive Canada. In fact, over the last number of days, uh, we've been reaching out to CBSA and Nova Scotia representatives from the government to ensure that that is indeed the case. Most importantly, this is a time for all members of the House to be united, as the leader of the opposition himself said, the leader of the Conservative Party said, so that we can work together to do what is necessary on the ground to support everybody who has been impacted. Thank you. 
Honorable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think you, uh, you could understand that we'd be confused when the Minister of Emergency Preparedness acknowledged that there were delays at the border. Now the Prime Minister is saying there were no delays and the Minister of Public Safety is backing them up. We're not sure what the message is coming out of this government, but I think we can all agree that given that the government has agreed to scrap, scrap the Arrive Can app, that this government will acknowledge that it was a failure. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would, I would say that uh, a tremendous tragedy has befallen uh, the people in Atlantic Canada. Uh, today is a time where we stand with all of them. At the beginning of this House, that was a sentiment I had heard. We have attempted to answer these questions. Uh, we have answered that Arrive Cam was not responsible for any delays. Uh, right now, I think we all have to be pulling in the same direction, uh, asking questions about what real solutions we can offer to Atlantic Canadians. I look forward to those questions, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Kildonan St. Paul. Unprecedented damage, homes destroyed, thousands were without power, and we're now hearing reports about fatalities. We know that Hurricane Fiona was certainly destructive and deadly. But meanwhile, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Public Safety are busy denying the Nova Scotia Premier was telling the truth that the Arrive Can app delayed the entry of American power line crews to get to those in need in Nova Scotia and the Maritimes. Is this the priority of the Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, to deny the claims of, the, of uh, Premier Houston and Nova Scotia Power? Is this really the their priority right now, Mr. Speaker, or will they apologize to East Coast Canadians? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been working uh, every moment with Premier Houston and with emergency officials. I again would repeat, I, I'm not sure how many times uh, different ministers and the Prime Minister can say it, there was no delay uh, and uh, I look forward to questions on how we can positively contribute to helping That's those right. in Atlantic Canada. That's right. Member for Kildonan and St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, a way to positive, positively contribute is not to pick a fight with the Premier of Nova Scotia in the middle of a hurricane defending the Arrive Can app. <laughs> Disrupted travel, damaged tourism, separated families, and caused thousands of Canadians undue hardship for years. But these Liberals refused to act until it was too late. It took the delay of American power line crews' entry into Canada to get to those in need for Liberals to finally act to end the mandatory use of Arrive Can. It is a national embarrassment, Mr. Speaker. Will they show some humility and apologize? Yes. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, in the spirit of uh, collaboration in this moment of emergency, I want to assure my colleague that I reached out, the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs reached out to the Premier of Nova Scotia to be sure that he had all of the support that we could provide from the federal government to help Nova Scotians at this difficult time. And that is what we are laser-like focused on, making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces are deployed, that we are matching contributions based on the generosity of Canadians and doing everything possible to help Nova Scotians and all Canadians so that they can get over this difficult period, and we'll continue to do that. The Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, at Roxham Road, criminal human traffickers are exploiting and robbing extremely vulnerable families. After avoiding the issue for years, the minister finally recognized this situation on Saturday. But when CBC asked what he will do to end this racket, he went back to prevaricating. Mr. Speaker, there is a solution, suspending the safe third country agreement. The minister of public safety can do this without asking the Americans. He knows this is provided under the agreement. Why is he still refusing to act to end human trafficking at Roxham Road? Mr. Speaker, we have an asylum, an asylum system that protects refugees and while also protecting our border. We have an agreement with the government of Quebec to transfer hundreds of millions of dollars to welcome refugees we have an agreement with the United States to protect the, to protect the process where there are consequences if there are abuses in the system. On this side of the House, we will continue to invest to ensure that refugees' rights are protected, as well as protecting the integrity of our borders. The Honourable Member. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's an answer that will delight traffickers. They're happy to hear that because their entire business model is based on the inaction of this federal government. If the minister suspended the safe third country agreement, migrants could use any border 
checkpoint in Canada instead of Roxham Road. In the blink of an eye, the minister could end this human trafficking racket that exploits families' horrible circumstances. He could do that unilaterally right now. So, there's a clear question here. How much longer will the federal government tolerate this, this inhuman situation at Roxham Road? Uh, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a strategy to deal with the situation with human trafficking at the border. We have a strategy to strengthen police services for law enforcement. We have an agreement with the U.S. We are modernizing the process to better protect people's rights. And we will continue to work together in close collaboration with the government of Quebec. That is very important. Thank you. Or foothills. Mr. Speaker, farmers in Prince Edward Island will be sending me photos of collapsed buildings, livestock without shelter, and acres of crops underwater. PEI farmers are still reeling from the Liberal self-imposed export ban on potatoes from last year. And now with harvest set to begin this week, another potato crop is in jeopardy. Their financial and mental health is deteriorating. And many of them said if they do not receive support, they are done. What concrete steps is the Agriculture Minister taking to help Atlantic Canadian and Quebec farmers who have been impacted by the hurricane? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for his question. And since it's the first time I'm rising in this House, my, hearts are, my heart is with all the families, and especially farming families. I myself have had the opportunity to speak with the chair of the PEI board, Potato, and we know that it's an issue in PEI. We are working with provinces. Officials have been in contact, and I've also been in contact with many boards who are going to be reporting back and assessing damages, and the federal government will always be there, as they've been there for BC farmers, will be there for Atlantic Canadian farmers. Thank you. Four foothills. Well, conversations aren't enough. And they can't be the fallback position of agri-stability and advanced pay payment programs because they know the impact of this hurricane has been profound. Farmers in, a, in Annapolis Valley have lo the, it's a significant losses in the apple, in the apple uh, orchard. They cannot meet the threshold of many of these programs. And even if they did meet the threshold, they do not get payments for months and years down the road. That is much too late. Farmers in Atlanta, Canada and Quebec need support now, again. What concrete and specific steps is the Agriculture Minister taking to ensure that those farm families get their crop off and survive this disaster? Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again my honourable colleague for the question. He knows, he really well knows that there are business risk management already in place. And if those don't respond to the needs of the farmers, there is an ag recovery that can be triggered. And we're currently having conversations with uh, uh, provincial officials to assess the damage. I myself will be meeting with uh, many stakeholders up in the Atlantic region and receiving phone calls later on this week as they are still receiving the assessment of damages. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When asked, farmers have stated that their number one worry is not the markets, it's not the weather, it's not international trade, it's the policies of this federal government. Yeah. The delivery of seeds and plants from to the farm incurs the carbon tax. The manufacture and delivery of fertilizer to the farms incurs the carbon tax. The delivery of farm products to market incurs the carbon tax. And this government's plan for the carbon tax? To triple it. So in a time of 10% food inflation, will this government finally give Canadian families a break and cancel this planned tax increase? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I find it quite difficult to listen to the member opposite speak about, about this, as many of his members, including the leader of his party, We've just risen to this house to talk about the impacts of Fiona. And we know that it's linked to climate change. And we know we have to do more to fight climate change. And we know because of climate change, there are more hurricanes on our east and western coast. And they are more and more severe, Mr. Speaker. So I'm having a really, really hard time to, to find an answer to this question. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellon. Mr. Speaker, this weekend, Hurricane Fiona violently struck the Atlantic provinces. It also affected the Magdalen Islands and caused considerable damage. I know that the Minister of National Revenue is working very hard 
to ensure that the inhabitants there receive all necessary assistance. Can the minister update us on the situation in the Magdalen Islands? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for Alfred Pellon for the question and for his support. My colleagues and I are working with local and provincial partners to meet the needs of affected individuals and the community. I'm staying in constant touch with Magdalen Islanders and the cleanup stage is already well underway. I'd like to take a moment to thank volunteers and responders who played a key role, not only on the islands, but throughout Atlantic Canada. Mr. Speaker, thank you. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, no one can afford the Liberals' tax and spend agenda, but their cost of living crisis and tax hikes, it hurts low and fixed income Canadians the most. Pioneer Lodge in Lloyd Minster has housed low income seniors since the 1960s, but last year the Liberal carbon tax added over $26,000 to Whoa. their expenses. That's going to quadruple under the Liberals' plan. The Lodge is now forced to increase rent on the very people who can least afford it. So, will these NDP Liberals cancel their tax hikes on homes, heating and eating? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives continue to flip-flop when it comes to the economy. Exactly one week ago, the Conservative House leader described our inflation relief plan as a little bit like pouring water on a grease fire. It looks like it's going to help, but it just makes the problem even worse. But just yesterday, he did a U-turn, saying putting tax dollars back in the pockets of Canadians is something that Conservatives have always supported. I'm glad the Conservatives have seen the light on the GST tax credit. Now it's time to get on board on housing and dental. From a member for Bay of Quinty. Mr. Speaker, Canada is number one. Unfortunately, it is number one in the world for lack of affordable housing, acute care bed shortages, and priciest cell phone bills. And now we're number one in taxes to farmers, planned tax increases to paychecks, and triple increase to the carbon tax, when Canadians pay more for taxes combined than for food, for shelter, and for clothing. Wow. Mr. Speaker, when the Prime Minister said that Canada's back, Canada didn't know it meant to the back of the line. Right. Conservatives understand that number one is the front of the line, not the back. Why doesn't this government? Yeah. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Conservative House Leader is to be believed, the Conservatives have now seen the light when it comes to oh, supporting Canadians right. with the GST tax credit. Better late than never. The Conservatives claim to care about housing too. So, may I suggest the next Conservative flip-flop? It's time for them to also support our $500 one-time payment to help vulnerable Canadians who are struggling to pay their rent. It's never too late to do the right thing, Mr. Speaker, even for Conservatives. The Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville. <laughs> on the top of mind, people in my communities and across Canada are crying out for compassion from this Liberal government. Increased payroll taxes are hitting at a time when a lot of our small businesses are struggling to recover and to maintain their employees. Those same workers are struggling to put food on their families' tables, put gas in their family vehicle, and to keep a roof over their families' heads. Will this government restore Canadians' hope? cancel their planned tax increase on Canadians' paychecks. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the EI contribution rate today is 158. Next year, it will go up to 163. Both of those rates are lower than the EI contribution rate was in every single year when Stephen Harper was Prime Minister. Yet the new Conservative leader, who was actually Employment Minister under Prime Minister Harper, now wants to slash our contributions. So who do the Conservatives think is the better economic manager, Prime Minister Harper or the new Conservative leader? <laughs> The Honourable Member for Guelph. Harper. Canada's overdose crisis continues to have a tragic toll on our community in Guelph and in communities across the country. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has only worsened this crisis due to increased feelings of isolation, stress, anxiety, and the changes in the availability of support services. Recently, the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions visited my riding to announce over $2.9 million in funding for five innovative community-led projects across Guelph. Could the Minister please speak to the importance of utilizing local expertise and working across multiple community organizations to help those who use substances to get the support that they need? Honourable Minister. I, I, I thank the member for his question and tireless advocacy on this issue. Too many lives have been lost to the toxic drug and overdose crisis. Ensuring local organizations have the necessary resources and capacity to support their communities is essential to ending this tragedy. The five innovative community-led projects we announced together will allow for increased safer supply capacity as well as improved outreach for people dealing with problematic substance use. This funding will also help increase access to multiple supports for youth in the Guelph region and support training and certification for the truly effective peer support workers. A member for Churchill, Kiwetnuk Askey. Mr. Speaker, with Orange Shirt Day fast approaching, we're going to see once again a government that talks a good game about respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples, but doesn't follow through. Clean drinking water, deadline after deadline missed. Overcrowding and homes in disre disrepair on First Nations, barely a dent. And for all this government's public commitment that communities must lead their own searches for the unmarked burial sites of their children, communities are saying that this government is dragging its feet instead of supporting them. Can the government explain why, when it comes to really supporting Indigenous communities, their answer is no? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, as an update to this House, I, I think folks would appreciate to know that there are about 91 communities that have now received funding to do searches on their own time at their own pace. It's something we obviously have to respect as a government. But if the member opposite has a community in mind that, that needs to be brought to my attention, please do so, and I'll ensure that the funding is provided expeditiously. Thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Richmond, North Abasca. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows about the endless passport delays saga. And unfortunately, we're now seeing the same problem with EI, despite low unemployment levels and fewer applications. Public servants are saying they feel powerless and can't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Meanwhile, Canadians are paying the price for a service that should be theirs by right. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what concrete measures have been taken to deal with these skyrocketing, unacceptable wait times? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for that question. I can assure him that Service Canada agents are continuing to help Canadians with EI, with pensions, with passports. We will continue to ensure that Canadians receive these services. With regard to EI services, I can assure my colleague that everyone is aware of these changes and will deliver. That's all the time we have for oral questions. Time we have. 